Good evening and welcome everybody. My name is Chuck. I'm with uh, San Diego 9-11 Truth Group and we have a very special evening for you tonight. We want to thank you all for coming. To get into our program, uh, tonight's talk by Christopher Boleyn is titled Tricked into War 9-11 and the War on Terror. Um, I should also mention uh, Chris has uh, come from overseas and is, is on an American tour. We have a collection basket back there on the table if you'd like to help uh, defray some of his travel expenses. Anyway, Christopher is an American investigative journalist, author, and author of Solving 9-11 set of books, including his latest, The War on Terror, The Plot to Rule the Middle East. Chris has a history degree from UC Santa Cruz with a focus on Israel and Palestine. He's written extensively on the Middle East, vote fraud, depleted uranium dangers, and the history and geopolitics of the 9-11 terror attacks. Chris joins us tonight as he continues to speak about 9-11 and tours across Europe and America. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Christopher Malin. Very good. It's nice to be here. Nice to see all these friendly people that I've met before. Pleasure to be back here. Um, I'm not really on a tour this year. Uh, I was invited to speak at USS Liberty event in Texas yesterday, and then I was invited by San Diego Truth Group, uh, Melise and, and Ted and, and my friends, um, to come and speak here. So um, this presentation is not so much about the details of September 11. This presentation is about 17 years of deception. 9-11 is going to be the 17th anniversary coming up this week. And it's also 17 years of war. For 17 years, this country's been at war. And most people in this country are unaware of what this country, our United States, is doing in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in, in, across, in Yemen, in Mali, in many countries. So what happened is that 9-11 was done to trick us into war. And if you understand, you need to understand what this war is all about. What is the real strategic plan that the United States, for example, Syria. Right now, the United States is on the verge of war with Russia in Syria. It's uh, heating up quite, quite quickly there. Um, the, the United States is involved in occupying the eastern third of the country. And Russia says, Russia and Syria says the Americans have to leave. But the United States. So why are why are U.S. troops occupying Syria, a nation where there is no U.S. interest whatsoever? Now, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is what is the real strategic plan and who this plan serves. This is my uh, uh, my former my previous uh, pro my protest at the Oscars about solving 9/11 ends the war. What that means is when you understand the truth about 9-11, the war is over for you. You will understand that the war is a hoax, is a lie. My background is I was an investigative journalist in Washington, D.C. when 9-11 happened. Uh, I have a BA in history, uh, Israel and Palestine was my focus. I've written the Solving 9-11 set of books, and the War on Terror, the Plot to Rule the Middle East. I have a lot of those little books with me, left over from Texas, so if you'd like to get a copy of the book, whatever donation you want to give, take a copy home with you. It's a small book. It's very important. I made it to be small and concise because it's a very important message. Americans have to understand what the war on terror is all about. It's not at all about fighting terrorism. It's actually using terrorism to wage war against independent countries. So the Solving 9-11 set of books investigate various aspects of the, of the terror atrocity. And my focus has always been from the beginning, who is behind 9-11? And why was it done? This is the large book, the original articles, contains my books for the first, my articles for the first 12 years I was working as a journalist on 9-11. Now, the war on terror was a policy coup by deception. It was blamed on Muslims in order to initiate the war on terror. Behind the war on terror is a covert plan to redraw the map of the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, to break these countries up into fragments. Understanding the origin of this plan is crucial to comprehending the deception that has changed our world. Both 9-11 and the war on terror have a common origin. 
They were con both conceived by Israeli military intelligence. That's not Mossad, that's Amman, A-M-A-N. In the 1970s, under the leadership of Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin was the leader of Israel in 1977. And when Begin came to power, that's when the, the real old terrorists took power in Israel. Menachem Begin was known, is known as the father of terrorism. This is Menachem Begin, he was born in Russia, came to Palestine in 42, became the leader of the Irgun in 44, bombed the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in 46, committed the Deir Yassin massacre in 48, where they massacred an entire Palestinian village, uh, created the Likud party in 1973, became prime minister in 77, and promptly invaded Lebanon in 1978. This is the emblem of the Irgun. This shows this larger uh, territory called Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And this is what they aspire to. They aspire to creating a state, the, the Likudniks, from the, from the River Nile to the River Euphrates, and taking pieces of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, along the way. It's interesting to note that the, although Menachem Begin was the head of the Irgun, which is part of Vladimir Jabotinsky's uh, Zionist movement, <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu's father, Bibi Netanyahu's father, Benzio Netanyahu, was the executive director of the new Zionist movement when Jabotinsky died. Jabotinsky is the founder of this radical revisionist Zionism called the New Zionist Organization. Founded in New York City. Here's the father of terrorism. In, this is Menachem Begin and Bibi Netanyahu. And in 1974, a British journalist asked Mr. Begin, how does it feel in the light of all that's going on to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Begin said, in the Middle East, he said, in all the world. So he put on himself the mantle of being the father of terrorism in all the world. 9-11 was a false flag terror atrocity designed to instill fear and rage in the American population in order to get public opinion to support the war on terror. A pre-planned, the war on terror is a pre-planned Zionist war agenda to be waged under the pretext of fighting terrorism. So starting the war on terror was the reason why 9-11 was done. The war on terror itself is much older. So 9-11 was a policy coup in this country that brought us the global war on terror and a series of these disastrous and costly wars. This is from Iraq. They call it also, they also call this war on terror, they call it the long war. This is written by people who support the idea of fighting this war. Um, the war on terror is the longest and most expensive war in US history, yet there is very little public resistance to it and no public political debate on ending it. That's partly because there is no awareness in this country of what we are, we, what we've done in Iraq or Syria. For example, last summer we, we bombed Mosul and Raqqa, two very large cities, one in Syria, one in Iraq, and yet there were no pictures in the newspaper of, of what, we, what we were doing, none. Now this is what uh, President Trump said a few months ago. He said, we have spent seven trillion dollars, trillion with a capital T, Seven trillion in the Middle East. You know what we have for it? Nothing, nothing. And he's right. And this is from the, the man who wrote The Art of the Deal. So if this deal is so bad, as he, as he says, we need to reverse this deal. We need to understand it, that if this deal is, is plundering the wealth of this country. How it works is that the, the war on terror is not just the name of a, it's not just a clever name. It's, it's a legal term for the authorization to use military force. What this means is that two days after 9-11, Congress passed a bill that gave the president the right to declare war in any place, in any country against anybody who he thought was involved in 9-11 on his own determination. And these are some of the countries that have been, where they have used this authorization to wage war. But of course, have these countries all been involved in 9-11? No, of course not. So it's, it's a fraud. Here, the fraudulent war on terror is based on the official myth of 9-11. This gives you an example of how much money is being spent. We're spending $400 million per victim of terrorism in this country per year. $400 million per year per victim of terrorism. It's a fraud. The war on terror is an Israeli stratagem. 
pushed by Netanyahu since 1979 to trick the United States into waging war against Israel's enemies. And George Bush, I mean, uh, Donald Trump has supported this lie when he, when he re-engaged in, in uh, Afghanistan. He said in August of last year, he said that 9-11, the worst terrorist attack in our history, was planned and directed from Afghanistan because that country was ruled by a government that gave comfort and shelter to terrorists. So although he said that he was, his instincts were against the war in Syria and Afghanistan, he supports the lie and supports the war. So the war goes on. This is Wesley Clark, who, who was running for president. He was a former general, a very high-ranking uh, commander of American forces in, in Europe in the 1990s during the uh, operation in Yugoslavia. And he said, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're an American, you ought to be concerned about the strategy of the United States in this region. What is our aim? What is our purpose? Why are we there? Why are Americans dying in this region? That's, that's, you can ask yourself that question, why are Americans in Syria? Why are we in Afghanistan? Why are we in Iraq? Why? He said, what happened on September 11th is that we didn't have a strategy. We didn't have bipartisan agreement. We didn't have American understanding of it. And instead, we had a policy coup in this country. A coup. A policy coup. Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy, and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. So when he says we didn't have American understanding of it, he's implying that we had some other country interpreting 9-11 for us, which is correct. It was Israel. Here is, the, here is the defense policy board, three of the principal members of that, Paul Wolfowitz, Dov Zakheim, and Douglas Fife. Some of them are dual nationals. They're sitting at the table with the Israeli military chief of staff, Shal Mofaz. This is in the Pentagon in January 2002. And what they were discussing is what would be the American response to 9-11. And as, as Wesley Clark points out, he came across a memo. He was a very high-ranking officer. He was at the Pentagon after 9-11, and, he, and he, he saw Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz. And one of the generals called him in and said, sir, we made a decision we're going to war with Iraq. This is 10 days after 9-11. He said, we're going to war with Iraq? Why? I don't know, he said. I came back a few weeks later. By that time, we were bombing Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? He said, sir, it's worse than that. We're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. Well, as you can see from that list, the six of those seven countries have already been done, and we're threatening to make war with Iran, with Iran any day. The sanctions and things, sanctions, the economic sanctions that apply to Iran are a form of warfare. Now, what's happening here is that what's being applied is something called the Yenon Plan, the Israeli plan called Yenon, named after the author Oded Yenon. And this plan is an Israeli plan from a Likud strategist to break up the Arab states, starting with Iraq and Syria, into statelets, into small ethnic statelets. It's often called Balkanization, because that's what they did to Yugoslavia. Break it into a section with the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds. And that's what's been, do that's what's been done to Libya. That's what they're done doing to Iraq. That's what they're trying to do in Syria. And what happened in Syria is they ran into an obstacle called Russia and Iran. And they've been thwarted. So this plan has been stymied by the presence of Russia. And they are really ticked off about that which is why they, there's so much anti-Russian propaganda, because they're, they're pushing, pushing, pushing for war to, to finish Syria, but also to have hostility with Russia and Iran. Now, this is Hillary Clinton in 2012. Uh, Hillary Clinton wrote in an email that the best way to help Israel is to use force in Syria to overthrow the government. This email proves that Obama and Clinton were, trying to, were, were seeking to overthrow the Syrian government, an elected government, in order to serve Israel. Now this is a photograph from uh, Syria, near Damascus. This is the Palestinian camp. This photograph shows the Yarmouk camp. Now, it, it, today it's in ruins. It had a population of over 100,000 people. Today it has 200 left. The Yarmouk camp in, in Damascus lies in ruins, with hardly a single building that has not been destroyed or damaged. Almost all the Palestinian refugees who were there have now fled. 
This, this shows you how this war, this, in, this, in this incident, the Palestinian refugees were being targeted. This is a Palestinian camp. And what happened is ISIS infiltrated the camp, then the war was waged against ISIS, and who got hurt? The Palestinians. ISIS is like a moving target. Wherever they put ISIS, then they go and attack. Same thing they did to Raqqa and most of them. This is from Linda Hurd. She's a British expert on the Middle East. And she, she wrote this, is the United States waging Israel's wars? She said, there's one thing we do know. Oded Yanon's 1982 plan, the Zionist plan for the Middle East, is in large part taking shape. Is this coincidence? Was Yanon a psychic? Perhaps, she says, alternatively, we in the West are victims of a long-held agenda, not of our making and without a doubt, not in our interest. So we're spending all this money and, and fighting all this war and taking the food off American tables to fight a war for somebody else? What's going on here? This is the plan, the, the Israeli plan is to conquer this area between Iraq and Egypt and call it Eretz Israel. This is the plan of the Likud. The Likud doesn't, doesn't hide this. This is, what, this is what Irgun wanted to do. This is what Netanyahu wants to do. They aspire to this. This is part of their megalomaniac plan. In order to do this, they foment they foment strife between the various ethnic groups in these countries. And that's easy to do because there's Sunnis and Shiites and Christians and Jews and, and uh, Kurds. So what, they're, what they've done is that they've, they increase the tension by doing things like car bombs and, and, and uh, assassinations in order to get these groups to fight each other. And, and it says, this is from the Yanon plan, the dissolution of Syria and Iraq is Israel's primary target on the Eastern Front. The dissolution of the military power of these states serves as the primary short-term target. That's exactly what the United States has been doing for the last 17 years. <laughs> Actually, of course, the war in, in uh, Iraq has been going on for now 27 years, having begun in 1991. And in what, what the United States has also been involved in is supporting the Kurds in the north so that they've, they've tried to break away the Kurdish regions of these countries into separate countries called Kurdistan. Uh, it's important to note that in the northern part of Iraq, the Kurdish area, um, the major holder of the oil reserves in that area is a Rothschild company called Janelle Energy. Now this is what was going on last summer. This is in Mosul, Iraq, is I think the second largest city in the, in the country. It was pounded. The United States and Kurdish forces pounded the city for months and destroyed. This is the famous Mosque of Al-Nuri, destroyed in the battle. This is Raqqa. At the same time they were pounding Mosul, they were pounding Syria's Raqqa. At least half the city was totally destroyed. Now this is de destruction on a biblical level. This is the kind of thing you read about in the Old Testament, where they destroy, utterly destroy cities. Why is the United States destroying major cities in Iraq and Syria. What, what's the point? Why are we doing it? It's our tax dollars at work. They pounded this poor city with so many artillery, they wore, out the, they wore out the artillery pieces, the American artillery pieces they were using. They were firing so relentlessly. This is from the northern part of Iraq. It's, it, it was, it's, it's headed by a, a, a family named the Barzani family. That was the leader, Masoud Barzani, with the turban there in the lower left. His father was Mustafa Barzani. In the upper photos, you can see that his father was very close to Mossad. There he is, his father speaking to the head of Mossad in 1966, I think it was. And here is Mr. Barzani going to Israel and meeting Moshe Dayan. This is his son, and this is what his son was trying to do. His son was trying to create an independent Kurdistan in northern Iraq. And when they had these rallies, you can see that the Israeli flag flies right alongside with the Kurdish flag because this is a this is an Israeli plan to break up Iraq and Syria by giving the Kurds their own state. So here's September 11th happened 17 years ago and the media has imposed on us the public a false story, a narrative that radical Islamic terrorists were to blame for 9/11. Now, if you accept that logic, if you accept the the official story, you will be trapped, you will be trapped in their logic of war. But if you understand that the 9-11 story is a lie, then you will understand that the war on terror is equally a fraud. And you'll be liberated from it. And that's what we have to do, is we have to liberate ourselves, we have to understand the source of this terrorism, 
in order to liberate ourselves from this madness and this war. And we have to, we have to liberate the whole country. We have to, we have, this has to be a popular movement. What they did is that they, after 9-11, on 9-11, they declared it an act of war. And here's, this is a CIA paper, USA Today. You see here it said they have 86% say attacks are the acts of war. So in one day they had done a survey and, and give you this, this nice number that most people think is an act of war. Now it's very important when you call it an act of war because it no longer is a crime that's going to be investigated and tried, it becomes a, an act of war. And that gives the president the right to take action and, and to get justice by waging war rather than having an investigation. Now this is a quote from Larry Johnson, former deputy uh, of counterterrorism. He's talking about how these Florida, these Florida guys were, were not really who they, you know, the, the hijackers were not really who they said they were at all. He said, we don't have anything in history to compare with this. The only thing that comes close to it is a former Soviet intelligence operation. What he's saying is that the planning and, and the sophistication of the 9-11 plot was so complex that it was, it was something like the Soviets would have dreamed of. I went to Germany after 9-11 because I, I realized it would, be, it would be unsafe to be talking about how, the, writing articles about how this is all a lie when our country was going to war based on that lie. And I spoke to this man, the former president of German intelligence, and he told me that the deathly precision and magnitude of planning behind 9-11 would have needed years of planning. He said such an operation would have required the fixed frame of a state intelligence organization. So what state are we talking about? What state intelligence organization is behind 9-11? Well, another one of his friends, Andreas von Bülow, another former uh, German intelligence expert, told me right off the bat, I said, who do you think is behind it? He said, Mossad. And, and when I wrote that in my newspaper, he was a little bit shocked because he said he had told the exact same thing to every German journalist, but they never wrote it in the papers. They never repeated that. It wasn't, that was not reported. So I'm going to point out some of the, the key Israeli connections to 9-11. When Israel was being created in the 1940s, the U.S. Uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff did 13 papers to determine what would be the U.S. policy regarding the new state of Israel. And what they wrote in the 13th paper, they wrote that Zionist strategy, Israeli strategy, will seek to involve the U.S. in a continuously widening and deepening series of operations intended to secure maximum Jewish objectives. And they define what were those Jewish objectives. They say one was the expansion of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, into Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. The second is the establishment of Jewish military and economic hegemony over the entire Middle East. That's what's going on. Now, this is to give you a, a, just an idea of Israeli or Zionist terrorism prior to the state of Israel. In 1944, Lehi, that's also the Stern Gang, assassinated the British minister, Lord Moyne, in Egypt. He was in charge of the whole Middle Eastern area for Britain. In 1946, they sent letter bombs to British officials, in, including the foreign minister. In 1946, they bombed the King David Hotel, Irgun, killing 93 people. In 1947, Irgun placed bombs at the colonial office in London. In 1947, Lehi sent letter bombs to the Truman White House, to President Truman. In 48, Hagan, Haganah and Irgun bombed the Semiramis Hotel in Jerusalem. And in 48, Irgun and Le Lehi massacred the entire village of Dir Yassin, a Palestinian village near Jerusalem. That's just what they did before. That's just a very short list. There's many more things. And these are, this is the Jewish terrorist. When the Jewish terrorist bombed the King David Hotel, it was done by this man, Menachem Begin. He was in charge of the operation. And they blew up the hotel because that was the... That was the the offices of the British intelligence, of the British headquarters for the military mandate of Palestine. Killed 93 people. Uh, a little bit after that, a few months after that, they bombed the British embassy in Rome. And then this man, his name is Yitzhak Shamir, he was in charge of Lehi, or the Stern Gang. They killed the United Nations mediator to Palestine, who was sent there when the war broke out to try and make peace. They, his name is Volker Bernadotte. And they killed him. And you can see that this is the New York Times. They say the Stern Group is blamed. And it was, it was very clear that this was, this was being done um, by Jewish terrorists, Zionist terrorists. Now, in 1948, then Menachem Begin came to New York City at the end of the year. 
and Einstein lived in New York, Albert Einstein, and he and 26 Jewish intellectuals wrote a letter to the New York Times protesting um, Menachem Begin. And one of the key chapter, one of the key parts of that letter said that the public avowals of Begin's party, the Irgun, the what became the Likud, are no guide whatsoever to its actual character. Today they speak of freedom, democracy, and anti-imperialism, whereas until recently they openly preached the doctrine of the fascist state. It is in its actions that the terrorist party betrays its real character. From its past actions, we can judge what it may be expected to do in the future. That's exactly right. When Begin came to power in 1977, he began employing once again his tactic of terrorism. 77, they came to power. These are three of the, the triumvirate. That's Begin and uh, Ariel Sharon and Yitzhak Shamir. Now, it's interesting that there's a, a book uh, by an Israeli called Rise and Kill First that's a bestseller in the New York Times. And in that book, it reveals that this man, Chief of Staff Rafael Eitan, in, in 19, from 1979 to 1983, when Menachem Begin took power, this man ran a terrorist organization in Lebanon called the Front for the Liberation of Lebanon from Foreigners, in which they used car bombs and truck bombs to foment strife and war. They wanted to give a reason for Israel to get to war with the Palestinians in Lebanon and for the factions in Lebanon to fight each other. This is exactly what they did in Lebanon for those years and what they did, did in Iraq re until recently. Car bombs in between Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds so that you get groups fighting each other. It's an Israeli specialty. Yeah. This is the book. Uh, this is a little extract from the book. The aim was to create chaos amongst the Palestinians and Syrians in Lebanon without leaving an Israeli fingerprint, to give them the feeling they were constantly under attack and to instill them with a sense of insecurity. Now that's what they did in Lebanon for four years, that's what they did in Iraq for 10 years, that's what they're doing to this country since 2001. Look at what happened after 2001. Remember the, the bombs in Bali, after 9-11 they had bombs in Bali, bombs in Madrid, bombs in London, bombs in everywhere. And that was to, they, they, they took their, their scare tactics and went global with it. And that's what they want to do with us. They want us to be in fear. That's what the terrorism is all about, is to, is to make us afraid to allow them to do what they want to do with their wars. And, you know, in the final year of their, their little operation in Lebanon, they destroyed the Marine barracks in Beirut, killing 241 Marines. And there was one truck bomb, Sunday morning, very early, came in and drove in and blew up the barracks. And Casper Weinberger, who was defense minister at the time, uh, Secretary of Defense, said there, is, there was no knowledge, we in America has no knowledge who did the bombing. It was blamed on some little group called Islamic Jihad, which had no history, no past, no, no return address. You know, I surmise that this was the, another operation done by the Mossad. And, and the basis of that is, is that Viktor Ostrovsky, in his book, the, By Way of Deception, he's an Israeli Mossadnik from Canada, he said that Mossad knew the specific time and location of the bombing, but only gave the United States general information which was worthless. So Americans pay with their lives. And here are the Israeli terrorists of the 1950s. They're pretty famous men. This is uh, Shimon Peres, and that's Moshe Dayan, and this is Pinhas Lavon. This photograph was taken just a few months after they were caught putting bombs in American and British buildings in Cairo. And this was another false flag operation. Going back to the 1950s, they wanted to bomb American libraries and films and, uh, and theaters and what have you in order to turn the American government and American people against the Arabs, especially, specifically against Egypt. And here's Shimon Peres. After, just after he did this, the, the prime minister of the country at the time was shocked. And he said that Shimon Peres shares the same ideology as Pinas Lavon. He wants to frighten the West in supporting Israel's aims. This is the name of the game. This is what we're still are at today. Shimon Peres was the, prime, was the foreign minister of Israel when 9-11 happened. They want to scare the American people into accepting the Israeli logic of war. So that we will then fight Israel's enemies because we're so frightened of them. Now, I, this is what we were speaking about yesterday in Texas. This is the uh, attack on the USS Liberty. It happened in 1967 during the Six Day War on June 8th. And Israel mercilessly attacked this ship, killing 34 Americans, 
pounded the ship. And the communications between the pilots and the, the ground control went something like this at the crucial moment. They said, identify the ship. And the pilot said, it's American, it's American. Then the command came from uh, headquarters, sink the ship, no survivors. And they tried to do that, but by the grace of God, the ship did not sink. But if you understand this murderous attack by Israel on this defenseless American ship, it's a spy ship, it was in international waters off the coast of Egypt, but if you understand this Israeli attack and the intention of what they had to do, well, they wanted to sink the ship, blame it on Egypt, so that America would go to war with Egypt. Some people think that Lyndon Johnson was personally involved in this. He may have been, he, but he, he did prevent American planes from rescuing this ship. He called them back two times. And here's another one. This is, this is Libya, 1986, Operation El Dorado, in which the United States bombed Libya April 15th after the bombing of the LaBelle discotheque in Berlin. Now, what's tricky about this, what's very interesting, is that Libya was bombed after Mossad tricked U.S. intelligence by sending fake messages from Tripoli to a Libyan embassy, to a Libyan embassy in, in, in East Berlin. How they did that is they had a submarine off the coast, and they had a they rented an apartment in, in Tripoli, and they put a transmitter in the, in the apartment in Tripoli. Then they broadcast the, the communications from the, sh from the submarine, or the ship off the coast, to the apartment, and then beamed up into space. And the Americans picked up as if it was really a Libyan message. Oh, Libya is saying, congratulations on the job well done. And they tricked the Americans into thinking, ha, ah, Libya did it, see? And Ronald Reagan went bombed. So that's, that's just an idea of some of the deception, how Israel operates to get us to attack their enemies. War on terror, the evolution of an Israeli stratagem. A stratagem is a trick, a device to trick a nation trick people. So they even, they even control the creation of the legacy. When, when school buses, when you go to New York City, the school buses park around the block at this place. And young kids are taken here and shown, this is what the Muslims did to us. This is, you know, this is, this is. And, and so that this, that they're creating this legacy of hatred against Middle Eastern people, Muslims. Uh, and, 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 and it's all being done to further the Israeli agenda. And the media, which is very much science controlled as well, has for 17 years now pushed this false narrative about 9-11 and the war on terror. They've only been able to do that by suppressing the facts about what really happened. Because if they were to pre present the facts, they, the story would fall apart. Here we have the New York Times, three years after 9-11, the lead editorial. And this is a very telling comment, they say, in the very beginning, they say, in the three years since 9-11, we've begun to understand that it's possible to know what happened without knowing what happened. <laughs> now, this is the attitude that the main, the, the, the biggest paper in New York City takes about 9-11 truth. The media should have done its own investigation. I'm just one person. I discovered a lot. But, but if the New York Times, if the media had done an investigation, they would have discovered so much more. But they couldn't do that. Their hands were tied. They are tied by their owners. So here's our, here's our political predicament in a nutshell. If the government and media are lying to us about 9-11, it means that they are controlled by the same people who carried out 9-11. That our media and our government are controlled by the people who carried out 9-11. That's a very serious state of affairs. But that's where, that's where the logic tells us where we are. Now, this is, the, this is the conclusion here. I'm going to show you the six crucial elements of Zionist control of 9-11. This is, this is the hexagram signal symbol. Uh, a lot of people associate this with Judaism, but this is actually the Zionist symbol. The Zionist symbol, not a, not a Jewish symbol. First point, law enforcement. The Zionist controlled law enforcement. Michael Sheratov was in charge of the investigation, the non-investigation, and destruction of evidence. Point two, the mass media, interpretation of the crime. We, we know Philip Zelikow wrote the commission report. The media interpreted it falsely. Here we have, here's what he wrote, catastrophic terrorism in the elements of a national policy in 1998, and he went on to write this report. Third point, litigation. They control the court, legal discovery in the court. 
as I said, Alvin K. Hellerstein and his conflict of interest. Fourthly, they control security. They control security at the World Trade Center. They control security at the airports. These are the three guys, Shamir and, and Kugerman and Harrell. They own the company that, that screened the passengers at Boston Airport and Dulles Airport, what have you. It's an, it's an Israeli Mossad company. And as I showed you before, that the, the people that control security at the World Trade Center were Crow Associates, where that Albert Hamshalom Ben Dor was working. Uh, fifth point is that they control the government. Our, at that time, George Bush, you have all of these people who are advisors, second and third place advisors. Here, for example, Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State, her advisor was Philip Zelikow, new counsel. And this, is, this was the advisor to, to Cheney, and these are the advisors to the Pentagon. And the final point is that they control the military. They control the military in several ways. One of the most important ways is that they had control of the computers, the through P-Tech. They had control of all the, the government computers, airline computers, what have you. But they also controlled the Defense Policy Board. So they controlled the military response to the crime. They called it an act of war. Then they, they wrote this agenda that we will overthrow seven countries in five years. The rest is history. And as I said, that star is known in biblical times as the star of Renfron, which is a, a diabolical entity. Um, this is from the Bible. It says, Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Renfran, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Uh, this is to underline the point that 9-11 was a hideous crime of evil incarnate. It, it's, you have to understand that the people that did 9-11 are absolutely evil to the core. And don't forget that. And so that those people don't deserve any sympathy or any compassion. The people that plan to carry out 9-11 are working for the devil. And here is the, is, I'm at the very end now. This is written by a man named Dr. Alan Sabrowski who was at the uh, United States Army War College. Uh, director of Studies. He wrote the introduction to my book, the little book on the war on terror. And he said, the evidential trail for 9-11 in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq runs from PNAC, APAC, and their cohorts to the mostly Jewish neocons in the Bush administration and back to the Israeli government. None of the denials and political machinations can alter that essential reality. And this is the end. I, uh, this is a, a, a picture of me, uh, the last uh, February at the, world, at the uh, Oscars. And, you know, I had to sign with my friends, Mike Chickie and Anne, 9-11 Truth is the peace movement. Because what I'm, what I'm trying to explain or show to the people at the Oscars is that we have to understand that the truth of 9-11 will bring us peace. Because when you understand the truth of 9-11, the, the logic of war evaporates. So thank you very much. The only way to defeat deception is to increase awareness of the truth.